My obsession with surfing started long before I'd ever seen the ocean. As a young boy living in Michigan back in the 1960s, I watched movies like Ride the Wild Surf and TV shows like Gidget, and that got me interested in surfing. When Mom took me to the theater to see the movie The Endless Summer, I thought it was the coolest thing ever and decided right then and there I would someday become a surfer and travel the world in search of the perfect wave. When my dad moved us to Naples, Florida in 1972, I finally got my chance to start surfing. We were only a few houses from the beach and just a short walk from the two spots that had rideable waves, 3rd Avenue South and the Naples Pier. While the Gulf of Mexico certainly didn't have waves like the ones I saw in the Endless Summer movie, it did have plenty of waves to learn the basic fundamentals of surfing, and I had a blast when I finally got my first surfboard at age 14. It was a used plastic fantastic with a broken nose that I got for $60. I surfed every day there was waves and went through the whole first winter surfing without a wetsuit. No place in town sold board shorts or baggies as we called them back then, so mom sewed me a pair complete with a drawstring just like they had in the movies and magazines. I even managed to get my picture on the front page of the Naples Daily News newspaper. I started first at the pilings on 3rd Avenue South, which is where all the guys that weren't good enough to surf at the pier hung out. Once you were able to really surf and not waste any waves coming in, the natural progression was to move on down to the pier where the waves were much better and the competition in the lineup was more intense. Living so close to the beach was definitely an advantage and I could often hear the waves breaking from my bedroom window at night. A quick skateboard ride to the beach would confirm the surf was up and I'd grab my board and go. If the pier was the spot that day, I'd take my Schwinn Typhoon. Back then, there was definitely a pecking order at the pier, and the older, more experienced surfers got the best waves while the rest of us groveled for the leftovers. It was so much fun and I wanted more. Eventually, I paid my dues and worked my way up the pecking order to get to the top spot and the best waves. By that time I was out of high school and driving my own car, so I regularly ventured over to the east coast where the waves were much better and I could gain more experience. At the same time I bought my first 35mm film camera with the aspiration to take surfing pictures and get published in the magazines as I held on to the dream of traveling the world in search of the perfect wave. Feeling comfortable in all East Coast conditions, I got the travel bug and took my first real surf trip to Rincon, Puerto Rico. While I didn't get big while I was there, I did get some experience surfing over the coral reef, which was a change from the sandy bottom I was used to in Florida. It's a different ball game when you realize you can't stand on the bottom or fall deep on a wave unless you don't mind getting cut by the sharp coral or stepping on a sea urchin. Puerto Rico was a fun trip, but I wanted bigger waves. So in 1979, I drove out to California to spend the summer in Huntington Beach, which is one of the most consistent spots in Southern California. I got a little apartment just a few blocks north of the pier on Pacific Coast Highway and surfed every day. I was back into a pecking order situation again as the best guys were getting the best waves as I sat off to the side and took whatever was left over. I didn't care because the leftovers were better than anything I was getting back home and I felt like I was living the dream. California has a different vibe than Florida and being there brought me a little closer to what I saw in the movies. One swell at the Huntington Pier had waves bigger than I'd ever surfed before and I paddled out with my plastic fantastic rocket fish, without a leash I might add, and caught the biggest waves of my life so far. 
I returned to Naples with a ton of pictures and stories to tell my friends about how cool Southern California is for surfing and how the action on the beach wasn't bad either. With a solid, successful trip to California, I felt it was time to take the next step to my ultimate goal of surfing in Hawaii and that break I'd seen in the endless summer, the Bonsai Pipeline. I finally got everything in place to where I could travel to Hawaii in the winter of 1988, and my dream was about to come true. I really didn't want to go by myself on this trip, so I asked around the Naples crew if anyone wanted to go to Hawaii, and two of my friends stepped up. Vinny, seen here waiting patiently for me to spin my way out of the wave, said he would go, and the fact he was a photographer as well was a plus because he might be able to get a couple shots of me if I were to catch a few waves at Pipeline, or any waves for that matter. I won't travel with just anybody as I hate drama and trouble, which just takes away from the good times, and Vinny is a great guy and certainly responsible enough for a trip of this magnitude. I was super happy he volunteered to go on this trip. Brett said he wanted to go. He was a little younger than us and a little more reckless than us, and since Vinny and I aren't reckless, that made Brett the reckless one of the group. Now, I'm not saying I don't like to have a drink now and then, but Brett likes to drink a lot. We had fun surfing together. Here I am cutting him off on a wave at the pier, and then him returning the favor on a nice long wave that I scared him off of. It's all in good fun. He wanted to go to Hawaii, and I wanted him to have the experience, so he joined Vinny and I for an epic trip to Hawaii. The ultimate surfing destination. While we wait for our 747 to take off from Fort Myers and fly to St. Louis and then on to Honolulu, I'd like to point out that I brought only one VHS cassette tape to use for the entire week-long trip and used about 90 minutes of the 120 minutes of available recording time. I brought six rolls of 36 exposure film for my camera That's 216 pictures of the trip, and that's if I exposed all 216 frames correctly. Seems crazy that I'd have so little to capture such an epic and meaningful trip, but that's how it was done back then. Most people didn't even have a camera or camcorder, so I was still ahead of the game, but wishing now I had got much more of our trip on film and tape. Today, people take more pictures and video waiting for the plane to take off than I took the entire trip. Speaking of taking off, our 747 is good to go, so our next stop is Honolulu on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. We landed late in the afternoon, got laid right after we stepped off the plane, and had just enough daylight left to pick up our rental car and check into our hotel, which was just off Royal Hawaiian Avenue. Once we got all our stuff unloaded in the room, we took a short walk to Waikiki Beach and got our first look at Diamond Head. It had been a long day of traveling, so we were ready to call it a night and rest up for whatever the next day has in store for us when our adventure officially begins. After getting a quick look at Waikiki yesterday, we decided to take a drive along the coast and check out the scenery. Driving past Diamond Head, we hit a stretch of rugged but beautiful coastline and soon found a nice sandy beach with lots of people on the water. Wasn't any real rideable waves, but we stopped to check it out. Keep in mind, we didn't have any map to go by. We were just driving around and discovering spots. If there wasn't a sign, we'd just have to guess from what we had seen in the surfing magazines. After driving a ways with nothing but rocky coastline, this beach looked like a welcome oasis with that nice big sandy beach. It reminded me of this videotape someone gave me of the Gotcha Pro Surf Contest that was held the year before in 1987. It was held at Sandy Beach and it looked a lot like the spot we were standing at now. 
Let's roll that tape and compare locations. <laughs> Trying to work through the kind of board section. 
sometimes get a big injury. See a house park for locations on those turns. And look at this short little back walk. Taking it all the way to the beach. 
You just saw a moment ago, about 20 of them are going to cut this field in half down to the 10 finalists. Prepare. Let's welcome them out. How about some applause? Let's make them feel welcome. Bring them out to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Here they come, the top 20. Steinlager Challenge Bikini Finalists. Semi-finalists. Can you imagine having to be a judge to decide which 10 go forward and which 10 stay behind? Murderous choice. Hey, Buzz, I'll take either 10. I don't care.
brown hair, lives in Honolulu. She loves jazz dancing, water skiing, and boogie boarding. Hey, Buzz, I gotta ask this lady a question. This lady is runner up from last year. Sherry, you gotta tell us not just what's on your body right now, but what's inside your mind right now. I can't talk. She's excited. She's loved being here. Her secret wins. fantasy is to make love on a hot air balloon the best overlooking Greece. All right, Buzzy, this is it. This is the final showdown. We are going to determine a winner. A Miss Steinlager 1987 of the Gotcha Pro. She's going to win $1,200. And the key to Joe money. Teichel's apartment. No, that's free. Please, ladies, come on, come on. Okay, this distinguished panel of judges, in consideration of your cat calls, your cheering, your jeering, or whatever, has rendered their decisions. Five ladies in the top five, all winning money and prize. The winner winning 1200 bucks plus the limousine ride. Let's find out now. The fourth runner-up, fifth place overall, contestant number one in the finals. Step forward, please, Lelena Marie Santos. Okay, ladies, step forward as we call your names. She's fifth place, fourth runner-up. Next lady is third runner-up, fourth place overall, moving toward the top. Step forward, please. Enter number two, Tanya Hisatake. All right, let's hear it for Tanya. Walks away with 150 in cash. All right, Buzzy, we're down to our top three. Third time's the charm. You want to let us know who the winner is for the yep. second runner-up? Second runner-up wins 300 in cash. Sharon Kirkpatrick. Step forward, Sharon. All right, Sharon. Second runner-up, third place. Okay. Got two places left. Buzzy, we got two ladies. Hard decision indeed. Second place, winning how much this year? How much are you gonna 350 win? cash. 350 cash. Place. Step forward, please. Number four. That's whatever you want to call it. Rock and Foreman. Then we're gonna clear the stage and get on to the surfing competition final. The primary reason for the Gotcha Pro 87. Turn your attention now from the stage back to the scene. The final. The grand final. It's gonna be fun. Ben, from the Central Coast of Australia. Sam's going to fight down there. We're going to serve these people. So he's very, very experienced at boarding in this year. That's for sure. Glad we went to there. Take us from Sam. We don't need a high climb in here. He's right over the rock here. He's looking for the inside connection. You can see him driving his board. Trying to stay with it outside. Looking for a cover up for Mark Lynch. We got both these goofy fingers out at the same time. Then we run out of the cutting board, going out. Let's see if Martin Lynch can connect this all the way through, getting a lot of distance out of that rock turn. Go to the suit. For that last re entry, it'll redirect him back over here towards our direction. Look at that. Martin Lynch is eating slides from now on out. Go, Martin! Go, Lynch! And he's dropping in. A big boomer on the outside, carving around, good sweeping cutbacks, another off the lip, throwing some spray headed over towards the cutting board. Really aggressively attacking the serve. Both these servers really pulling out the stops. They know this is it. This is the grand final. We've got some battle on the outside. And it's set up. Then Winton. Great wave there. Then Winton. Carving around. He's headed towards trouble. He's over on the penny board. He doesn't seem too worried about it. Got a long ride for Ben Bogey Circus. Really swinging those cutbacks and pumping it. He is even more impressive. When you see how choppy the waves get pulled on him, the fact that he can hit all the way through is incredible. There he is, sprinting back out. Ben went really charged up. The big will drop right up into the pocket. Martin is clearly going up.
trying to get through his eyes, teaching away. I Man, I don't know if you can see it from up there, but he literally got back right around that rock. And he used that little ball of white water to ricochet himself to a very, very speedy cutback. Very dramatic, especially for Beach Ball here. Glenn went all the way to the beach. your surfing throughout the event was that sort of go for broke nature. I know, I think my brother was talking to you. 1987, Dr. Broke champion, Glenn Winton. And 
Oh, there's a prize. Okay, Glenn Winton. Pick it up, pick it up. There you go. There you go. Hey. It's a big hug, man. Miss Steinlager and our Gotcha Pro Champion for this year, Glenn Winton. Yeah, don't cover her legs there with that giant $5,000 check. Cover those $5,000 legs. Wow, that contest was crazy, and it was very cool seeing professional surfing in the 1980s. Sandy Beach was the perfect spot to hold a contest. I still can't get over how they had to surf over those rocks. That bikini contest was pretty memorable, too. I heard the after party at the Pink Cadillac was legendary. I hope you like my edit of that raw tape that was given to me. I would have used my own video, but I was about a year late getting there. Let's get back to our own Hawaiian adventure as we returned to Waikiki after exploring Sandy Beach and rented some longboards for a surf session behind the majestic and very pink Royal Hawaiian Hotel. After catching a few waves, we grabbed a cool drink and capped off our first full day in Hawaii watching the sunset from Waikiki Beach. If you feel lonely, I will be here and wait for the sun. It's getting closer, but it will never last down. Here by the ocean, fire is burning. Once we had fought off the jet lag, we were ready to sample the Honolulu nightlife, and there appeared to be plenty of nice prospects walking the sidewalks, but our go-to spot was the Pink Cadillac. This was the hot spot in Honolulu back in the 80s and 90s. They held concerts and special events and after parties like the one they had for the 1987 Gotcha Pro Surf Contest we just watched. They were featured on MTV, and anyone that visited Oahu with a thirst for nightlife made the Pink Cadillac their number one destination, and we did too. I'd venture to say that the Honolulu nightlife is just as vibrant and colorful as the beaches are during the day. Good times for sure. Our next exploration session took us along the coast past Sandy Beach and around to the North Shore. As soon as we came to a clearing, we pulled over to look at the waves. The spot didn't look familiar, but I'm guessing we were somewhere close to Velzyland. I'm not gonna lie, one look and we were both disappointed and intimidated. The waves were huge and the white water looked never ending. Our dream of perfect Hawaiian waves was shattered and there was no way we were going to paddle out in that. So back in the car we got and continued down the road. It wasn't long until we rounded another bend and came upon the unmistakable view of Waimea Bay, the place I'd seen in all of those movies. The surf spot where guys tried riding the biggest rideable waves at that time on big heavy longboards 
and more times than not, they were unsuccessful. Looking at those waves had our minds racing. I was glad we didn't have the right boards. Vinny was speechless, and Brett wanted to drink. We stood there and witnessed the awesome power of Waimea Bay. on the edge of Waimea Bay taking pictures of the waves that created surfing legends. This was a small day, but we were happy to at least get to see it break at all during the short time we were on the island. The waves over at Pinballs had a nice drop, but was nowhere near the size Waimea gets when it starts breaking proper. Standing there, it's hard to imagine the spectacle of watching it get 40 feet and closing out across the entire bay. Half of me wanted to paddle out and sit off to the side and just watch the others ride waves from the safety of the shoulder while getting a first-hand perspective. The other half didn't even know how to paddle out. The shore break was 
big and scary and if your timing is the least bit off you're gonna get drilled into oblivion the whole time we were there not one person paddled out or came back in so we had no clue as to how it was done I found out later that the best place to paddle out was right near the rocks where the shore break was the smallest that keyhole was also the best place to come back in I was perfectly fine being a cameraman that day, taking pictures and recording video to preserve the memory of the time I watched them surf Waimea Bay. It took us a while to figure out that to get to the bay from up by Velzyland, we had to pass a lot of other spots like Sunset and Pipeline that weren't really visible from the road, so with the light fading fast, we headed back to town so I could get a bigger board for tomorrow. Back in Honolulu, we hit the town and country surf shop, and after checking out their nice selection of boards, I decided to get one I thought would help me handle the bigger waves. I had a couple of choices and ending up getting the pink one over the other two that were white. The sole reason I got that one over the other two almost identical shapes was because it would be much easier for Vinny to spot me in the lineup if he was taking pictures. While I was paying for my new board and getting a local motion t-shirt, Brett and Vinny took the car to get some food and drinks at the store and would be back to pick me up. I found a spot on some steps to sit and wait for them to return, and as I was sitting there people watching, a really hot girl comes walking by. I don't know what it is with Hawaii and pink, but so far I was really digging the pink Cadillac the pink Royal Hawaiian Hotel, my new board, and now this super tight pink dress. As she strolled by for the second time, I got her to stop and we chatted for a while. She really liked my new board and told me she wanted to learn how to surf. As we talked, I began to wonder where Brett and Vinny were and thought something might have happened. I asked my new friend if she would watch my board while I ran down the street to see what was taking them so long. She said she would be happy to. I took off running so I could find the guys and tell them how I got my new board, set it down for just a minute, and the hottest girl ever somehow magically appeared. <music>
a flavor of a memory. Whenever all the stars above are shining, then I know I'll never be alone. Brett was just trying to negotiate the price of a case of Budweiser, and they were on their way back. So I returned to my board caddy, and she hit me hard again. I really needed to figure out a way to get her to watch my board for the rest of the trip. Maybe I could lure her with some surfing lessons. But I can't hear the silence you describe Don't be ashamed We can't always leave this place and go where no one knows our names Pack your bags We never needed their permission to believe in ourselves So come with me We could spend the I'm doing everything they said we'd never do In their universe, we're just causing trouble But nothing can hurt us in our bubble For better or worse, in an uphill struggle No regrets and windows down, 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 down. If you believe that story, you're going to love this one. We had planned to do some deep sea fishing, hopefully for billfish, but the charter captains at the dock told us it was a waste of time because the fish weren't out there. Props to the captains for being real and not taking our money for a three-hour tour. That meant we had some extra money in the budget since we wouldn't be spending it on a day of fishing. So we stopped at this exotic car rental place we kept driving by and ended up spending the day doing something entirely different. They had a Lamborghini Countach for rent and a Ferrari 308 like Magnum P.I. drove. But those were two-seaters and there was three of us. So we settled on this Ferrari Mondial which is a 2 plus 2 Cabriolet which means there was a back seat and room for the third person. We rented it for about the same as it would have cost us to go fishing, so technically we were still within our vacation budget. The top came down immediately, and we decided we would do one lap around the island while taking turns behind the wheel. First I needed to go get my board back from the board caddy after she borrowed it to go practice paddling. Once I got to the hotel and put my board away, we were ready to go for a ride. The winding coastal highway was perfect for driving a car like this, and we stopped along the way to soak up the scenery. I was almost too tall to drive it, and had to take my shoes off so I could clear the pedals as I heel and towed my way around those tight turns. My favorite part was driving it at night in Honolulu, with the top down and hearing that V12 scream in the cavern created by the high-rise hotels and apartments. Here's some video of the start of our island lap, with Brett going first in the driver's seat. Fucking sketchy, ain't it? Brett going, Vinny?
Did you cut the seat off anything? Yeah, I did.
driving a convertible Ferrari around the island of Oahu was definitely a unique experience and one I'll never forget. We returned it the next day and then loaded up our very boring Avis rental car and headed back to the North Shore to find some waves we could surf. We had been doing a lot of driving in the rental and needed some gas, so we pulled into a Shell gas station in Pupake and filled it up courtesy of my dad's Shell credit card. While we were very lucky to find a Shell station so I could use the credit card and save some cash, the pit stop put us right next to Iwakai Beach, which was a great spot for us to find some waves that were a little less intimidating than the ones we saw at Waimea. One look from the beach and I knew we found just the right break. I planted my camera in the sand and proceeded to burn up a few rolls of film. I didn't let the other pro photographers intimidate me and I fired away at anything that moved. The waves were good but not perfect. Certainly in our size range though and everyone was getting some great rides. Trailing a couple of beachgoers, I spotted another photographer on a rocky point off in the distance. For a moment I wondered if his location was better than mine, but it didn't take long for me to realize I had all I could handle right here from my spot, and I just kept shooting away and documenting all the wonderful scenery around me. Brett and Vinny caught some fun waves right out front, and while there were several surfers in the lineup, there was also plenty of waves up for grabs. There was so much action to photograph in the water and scenery along the beach, I thought I was in heaven.
came in for a break and it was now my turn to paddle out for a few waves. He hadn't used a camcorder before, so I gave him a quick lesson hoping he could record me on a few waves. It's simple really, just press the button to record, press it again to stop recording. Point the camera at the surfer and try to hold it as steady as you can. That's it. With everything preset, I hand the camera over to Brett, grab my board, and head down to the water. Yeah, I see the light. The first thing he does is mess with the zoom and pull the shot out so everyone looked like ants on toothpicks. Needless to say, everything he recorded was useless, and I didn't get any video of me riding any waves. I was really bummed, but at least he was willing to try, and I'm thankful for that. When I came back in, Brett said he liked my new board and wanted to test it, so I let him take it out for a few waves. Despite my board being a little slippery from my board caddy's suntan oil, he proceeded to catch this nice right. Vinny was finally done with his session, and Brett followed him in. I kept taking pictures. I noticed to my left the pipeline was starting to break, so after Vinny got dried off, I asked him if he would use my film camera and take a few pictures of me if I paddle over to pipe and catch one of those waves. With him all set, I paddled out and sat there in awe as I looked at my surroundings. I could see the reef below me and looking back the mountain behind me. There were only a few others out with me waiting for an occasional wave to roll through. Even though it was only Tina size, it was still Pipeline, the surf break I'd seen in all those magazines and surf movies for so many years, and now here I am poised and ready to catch a wave at Pipeline. Most of the waves were over there where we had been all afternoon, but one finally rolled through that I could catch and I paddled for it. If this was Naples, I would have faded into the pit on the takeoff, but this was Pipe, and all I wanted to do was shoulder hop and survive, and that's exactly what I did. So technically, I can say I surf pipeline, but we all know that's not proper pipe and it didn't break proper during our short stay, so it really isn't anything to brag about. It was much more about realizing a dream and finding a way to make it happen. The victory for me was being in Hawaii and sitting in the lineup at the Bonsai Pipeline. With a solid day of surf in the books, we headed back to town and celebrated with a nice dinner at the Honolulu Hard Rock Cafe and left with some souvenir hats and t-shirts. Tomorrow would be our last full day on the island, so we planned on returning to the North Shore one more time and hopefully get another day of waves like we had today. Upon returning to the North Shore and with a little more exploration, we found this break called Chun's Reef. It was a nice looking, primarily right breaking wave, although there were some lefts that looked to be breaking on a shallower section of the reef. A lot of waves were rolling through, and there were a lot of people in the water, so it looked like a good spot for us, especially with Brett and Vinny both being regular foot. I, however, as a goofy foot, had my eye over to the left that was breaking on the other side of the channel that was definitely bigger and less crowded. The break was called Jocko's, named after surfing legend Jock Sutherland, and the waves were exactly what I had hoped to find and surf in Hawaii. From the beach, the waves looked pretty big, and the few sets that rolled through looked bigger than anything I'd ever surfed before. What I liked is the waves emptied into the channel for an easy paddle back out. I was pumped for some of that. We took a vote, surf chuns or surf jockos. Jockos won and Vinny and I paddled out for the first session while Brett stayed on the beach to watch our stuff and hopefully redeem himself with a video camera and catch me on a few waves. And that he did. It was an easy paddle out and then over into the takeoff zone. It looked way bigger <laughs> once we got out there and we were really starting to feel the power of the Pacific. I finally took off on a smaller wave just to get one under my belt and paddled back out for another one. 
the waves were fairly consistent. It was the cleanup set you really had to watch out for. They would break 20 or 30 yards beyond our position, so it was easy to get caught inside, and that's what happened to me. I was already sitting pretty far outside when a huge set came through. I was duck diving the biggest waves of my life, and at the same time getting pulled up the beach with nothing but rocks behind me. I couldn't make the channel, and the next sandy spot up the beach looked about a half a mile away, so I was literally duck diving for my survival. It was a five or six wave set, and somehow I made it through them all. I then sprinted out and then back towards the channel, where I could rest and regain all that energy expended. It's hard to explain just how scary and physically demanding that was, but I'm sure any surfer in similar circumstances knows the feeling. Vinny had gone in by then and was now on my film camera and he managed to get this picture of me on one of the regular set waves. I caught the biggest waves of my life that day out there at Jocko's and it was also the biggest test of my surfing ability. While I passed the surf another day, I also gained a much greater respect and appreciation of the ocean and its power. It's very important to know your limits and on that day mine were right on the edge. I always knew it takes an experienced surfer several winters on the North Shore to get comfortable and there was no way this kid that grew up surfing one foot slop at 3rd Avenue South was going to conquer the North Shore on a seven day trip. But I sure had a lot of fun being in the middle of it all and living the dream of riding the wild surf. When I paddled in, Brett greeted me with some bad news. Somehow, he had lost the keys to the rental car. We looked all around the rocks, kicked the sand, and even borrowed a dog to see if it could sniff out the keys, but no such luck. Brett took responsibility and hitchhiked to Holly Eva to find a payphone so he could call a locksmith. While he was gone, I continued to take more pictures and videos. There was still some nice waves coming in on both sides of the channel. Surprisingly, it didn't take Brett all that long to return, and Uncle Willie was able to make us a new key in his van. Wasn't the best ending to our last day, but Brett stepped up and made it right, and I didn't drown, so I'm not complaining. That session at Jocko's was the last of the video and pictures I took of our trip. While I'm now wishing I'd taken so much more back then, I think we got enough to show just how our Hawaiian trip went down. We left the island the next day and headed back to Florida. What an epic adventure Brett, Vinny, and I had. It was everything we expected and so much more. For me, it was kind of like a reconnaissance mission to see if spending a whole winter on the North Shore would be my next step. Hawaii is like no other place I've visited and I'm thankful I was able to share the experience with my friends. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this story from the life of one photographer.
getting closer, but it will never 